both Miro Sensei and Shimabukuro Sensei used to speak all the time of changing the world from heart to heart to heart. Hey there. <laughs> What's going on? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 570 with Sensei Eric Johnstone. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host on the show. I'm the founder of Whistlekick, and I'm we want to get right down to it. I'm just a guy who loves martial arts. I love training. And that's why we do all that we do here at Whistlekick. And one of the things we do is this show. It's got a website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check it out. There's another website for all the things that we do, because we do a lot more than this podcast. It's whistlekick.com. Check it out. We've got a store over there. And if you find something in there that tickles your fancy, it's a weird expression, but we'll use it. You can use the code podcast15 to get yourself 15% off. We bring you two shows every week, and all with the purpose of connecting and educating and entertaining traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you like what we're doing, if you want to support it in some way, you could make a purchase or share an episode or leave a review, but you could also contribute to our Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistlekick. In fact, if you contribute a little bit of money, we're going to give you back more content, and not just the same content you can find anywhere. This is original content. 100% of what you find on Patreon is exclusive to Patreon. So you throw us a couple bucks a month, we're going to tell you what's going on behind the scenes, not just with Whistlecake, but with the show, upcoming guests, stuff like that. $5, we give you an exclusive audio episode. And it goes up from there. We've got people really supporting us. And I don't name names, but you all know who you are. I thank you. It means the world to me. Because, let's face it, the show is not ex inexpensive to put together. There's a, there's a lot of people involved, and I thank all of you for your hard work to contribute to this amazing production. So today's guest comes in as a referral, and I was warned. That sounds ominous, doesn't it? But not warned in a negative way, warned in a very positive way that this person was expecting I was going to have a great time talking with Sensei Johnstone. And guess what I did? We, well, I don't want to speak for him. I had a wonderful time, and I think that he had a good time, too. I think you're going to have, hopefully, almost as good of a time listening to our conversation. I just spent the last two minutes thinking about what else I could say before we roll to the episode, and I didn't come up with anything. Because this one, well, I just want you to hear it. So here we go. How are you? I'm well. How are you, sir? I'm well. How are you? doing very well you're not doing gonna very... see me it's it's not a video show oh okay no worries i don't even have a camera hooked up the joke i make with everyone is is you are welcome to to turn off the video and pick your nose all you want <laughs> we don't even have to worry about that part of it well i'll i'll turn off my video only because uh i don't need to look at myself the whole time it, it, it is a little awkward it is i get it yeah so video stopped there we go so uh very nice to uh to meet you here nice in you this uh, in this format and uh Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, very kind of you guys. Well, you know, we're, we're all about talking to martial artists about martial arts, and that, that makes uh, it pretty easy. You know, if, if somebody's not down to talk, then they probably weren't going to be a good guest anyway. Yeah, true. But if we say, hey, <laughs> do you want to talk about martial arts with a complete stranger for an hour? Anybody who says yes to that is probably going to be a good guest. Yeah. <laughs> so so you are you, where are you located? You up in uh, Vermont, New Hampshire? I'm in Montpelier. Uh, Oh, in Montpelier, yeah. Ah, oh, very nice. I I was uh, I lived up uh, Wilmington for quite a while. I went to Southern Vermont College, and uh, okay. I lived up in the hills there and worked at Mount at a ski shop at Mount Snow. And uh, nice. I uh, used to head up that way pretty frequently, and I absolutely miss it still. Where are you now? I live down in Westerly, Rhode Island, where my wife was born and raised, and uh, my family, my mom and dad, uh, my mom and stepfather live uh, over in Mystic, Connecticut, where my family immigrated to from Canada. So we're in a, uh, right on the shoreline here in, in southern Rhode Island. And uh, as I said, I married a girl from Westerly, so uh, I'll never get out alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good little place, though. Yeah. It's a good little place. Yeah, and uh, you, you, have, you have some ties with Andrew. Yeah, I, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Andrew last so october a year ago um when uh, myself and a, a dear friend of mine were invited to come up and teach at 
uh, the Budo Fest for the for White Crane Martial Arts in Keene. Yeah. Uh, led by Matthew Butler. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure you know all about that story uh, and the yeah. loss of his teacher a number of years ago. So he had uh, reached out to me. Uh, he had found me and reached out to me about, I guess it was a, a, a year after his, uh, his teacher's passing. And uh, uh, inquiry, he'd found our website and what it was we did and had seen some, some degree of overlap with what they, what his teacher used to, to, uh, provide instruction in at the dojo there. And, uh, I inquired about, uh, uh, coming for training and potentially becoming a student, which, uh, he subsequently did. Mm. And, uh, so I had the pleasure of not only meeting Andrew, but, uh, getting to sit in on his shodan test in, uh, Shorinu, uh, mm. karate. Uh, last year so that was that was very nice and uh just a really warm and and well all of them really warm and welcoming uh lots of good energy with andrew and uh he shows up pretty frequently to our uh to to our little uh our what was bi-weekly bi -weekly, not quite so bi-weekly anymore but uh our little bi-weekly uh uh dojo happy hour on zoom oh, nice. on friday yeah nice so yeah yeah, he's so, a good yeah. guy. He's a good guy. We recorded a couple uh, Thursday episodes. We, we do kind of topic-driven stuff on Thursdays, and we recorded a couple topics earlier today. Oh, very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah, I I, uh, I did get a chance to listen to the one that uh, about the junior black belts and such, mm. which he uh, which he had actually given me a call about uh, for some some thoughts on that. Uh, so that was uh, it. Was really neat. Uh, very well done, by the way. Oh, You're you. uh, very well done. Uh, uh, podcasts that you're putting out there Thanks. and uh you're, you're you're obviously very well polished with regard to to putting these together well if they're well polished then i owe it to the time that i've put in and the team behind me there you go because you i go. don't i don't do any of the editing anymore i just i show up i talk when it's time i stop talking yeah. and then i go <laughs> do something else yeah well no but you yourself that so sounds really good it sounds really good Thank yeah. you. Don't listen to any of the early episodes, then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, I, I won't say they're awful. I'll just say that once in a while, if I catch one of them and I press play, I stop very quickly. <laughs> you know, the it's only thing worse than your own voice is your own voice when you're aware that you're coming across like a like a fool. Right. Right. <laughs> Which, when you're me, seems to be more often than not. Mm. But, you know... <laughs> So how did um, how how did how did a guy from Canada end up in southern Vermont in and working at a ski shop in Rhode Island? Like how how did this all happen? <laughs> well, my family immigrated down to uh, Mystic from Ontario. Actually, I was born down here in a, into a Canadian family, and I've uh, kind of roamed back and forth between the two countries. Uh, my grandfather. Uh, was hired by the Mystic Seaport to do a lot of restoration work and initiate some significant projects there that uh, have uh, that he spent a good chunk of his life doing. And uh, and he once he moved to Mystic, despite the fact that he even into his you know into his eighties kept threatening to move back home, uh, never did. And we kept telling him, "Well, grandfather, you know, yeah, really." It's not going to work out so well because you are home, you know, you've built your life here, but, uh, <laughs> you know, so, uh, but, and so we, uh, they moved down here and then, uh, my mom, when I was growing up, you know, actually I was born when she was quite young. Uh, she was definitely a, uh, a product of the, uh, late sixties, early seventies counterculture, if you will. But, uh, we ended up kind of having quite a nomadic lifestyle, if you will. And, uh, uh, I perpetuated that just out of habit for, for quite a few years. Even when I was going to school, uh, in Vermont, I would go back to, back out to British Columbia, Canada, where my aunts and uncles were. And I had spent a lot of time in my youth, uh, uh, different stages I was in Alaska for a little bit. And I just, I don't know. I just kind of, I kind of roll, I kept that roaming thing mm. going and, lived in California two different times growing up and uh, yeah, you know, 
number of states in a Canadian province I've got under my belt at this point. Nice. Yeah. And, and when does martial arts first appear? So uh, the first, actually, the, it ties in pretty nicely there. Um, it was actually the first time around we were living in California. I, as I said, I, I grew up with a, with a, with a, uh, a hippie mom there, and uh, she was very much uh, interested in, in Eastern philosophy and spirituality when I was growing up. I mean, I remember the Zen books and Taoist books and such that were available at that time on her, on her bookshelf. So I was kind of familiar with them some of these things way back when and um and this is probably going to sound completely stereotypical but as a kid i loved the show kung fu with david carradine right and uh and so when we moved to california and i also didn't grow up with a father so when we moved to uh california we had moved all, around a whole lot uh, already by then and so kind of always causing upheaval, always changing and somewhere along the, and I wore glasses and my teeth were coming in funny. And, uh, I, somewhere along the line, I kind of, um, I just retreated inward, I guess, you know, and my mom, uh, based on her, her, uh, interests in, in Eastern philosophy, uh, thought that maybe this would be a good thing for me, you know, putting me into a, a martial arts school. So we were in San Rafael, California, and I was in grade five, I think. And we went to look at, at that time, one of the two or three, uh, we have actually looked at two of the two or three, uh, martial arts schools in, 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 in town. And even though, uh, San Rafael was only 45 minutes up the 101 from San Francisco. Uh, there weren't really that many martial arts schools there th at that time. So, uh, she, we ended up, she ended up choosing for me this really kind of even then old school feeling tempo school. Uh, and but they, you know, plain black E, no patches all over the place. Just, uh, really, uh, hard training, very, uh, despite what I came to find out later was more of an uh, American Kempo school. They were very, very karate, uh, in their approach. So, uh, it was, a, it was a good, good start and, uh, trained there, uh, until we left San Rafael and moved back to New England for a little while. And then it got a little harder to find places to train. And, uh, so like she uh let's, she tried let's to go back a yep. second for oh, know, okay let's, let's let's stay in san rafael for a moment oh okay and, and you know you you were you were into the movie kung fu and you know don't think i didn't notice your your very from from my perspective good pronunciation of that term you know very much not englishized you know americanized right there people people that don't know the the sound for kung fu it's like half g half k you you hit that perfectly as far as i can tell so i bet i bet we're going to come to something that tells us more about that in a moment or at some point but other than that it sounded like it was your mother's idea yeah it really was absolutely um i i really didn't even know that there were any such places in 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 town and i had certainly never seen any such place prior to that so i mean this must have been well, if i was in grade Five. This must have been like, I don't know, 79, 78, 79, 1980, something like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it was not a common thing at that point. So I wasn't even aware. She had, she had looked into it. She always found a way, no matter where we were, to be, to, to, to hook up with the very, um, the very international, uh, communities in in any given area so we, she had a lot of friends that she worked with from uh, that were chinese and korean and japanese and uh, among others others too but, uh, so she had a really interesting array of uh, uh, diverse array of, of friends and uh, they pointed her in the right direction with regard to finding what was available and it was uh yeah yeah so it was her it was her doing yeah and what were your initial impressions I thought it was, I thought it was fantastic. I especially like, 
they they did like private lesson stuff, you know, and you'd learn the the formalized like techniques, you know, the sequences, uh, almost like little mini kata, right? You know, but uh, re- required self defense techniques. But I really enjoyed uh, I really enjoyed the the the, the group classes, and um, at that time there really weren't a lot of kids in 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 training and certainly not in in that particular dojo so uh i they didn't really have a schedule set up to where there were kids only classes and such so i found myself uh as this guy in grade five and grade six training in these group classes with all these you know with all these full-grown practitioners you know for all age you know all 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 ranks and skill levels and uh it was fun. It, I just, I really, uh, I think that's where I started to come into my own. You know, I started to get involved in other sports because of that and started to realize um, that there was a degree of, um, you know, athletic ability and such. Because of that, I became a high school swimmer and a, a water polo player second time around in California. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, uh, it was the start of, you know, of uh, certainly finally blossoming still took a while but i thought that was the beginning yeah nice. all right so then you move east yeah what and happens? then there's a there's a little there's a little gap trying to find people to train with and uh and, but it wasn't too long i mean we were right back in california uh so let me let me let me, let me back let me kind of try to figure it out there yeah there was a little there were some tr- there were some training gaps there um, you know, I'd like to say that I had trained consistently since 1978 or 79, 80, whatever it was, but, um, there weren't many opportunities when we had come back to first, we were briefly in Pennsylvania for like the very, very shortest period of time because my mom had, uh, gotten a job in, in the, uh, energy industry and she had, uh, her mom had gotten ill. So she was trying to get back East. And so she took a job at a, a job site and once you're in that little perf- that track uh it's hard to get out of it and they start moving you around a lot anyway so there was a brief stint in pennsylvania um where there was nothing available that was a, that was a year and then i was up to back into to mystic at my grandparents place for a while while my mom stayed in in pennsylvania and uh so that was grade eight i did some training with a man named John Upholtz, who was a, a karate practitioner. And he had a small group practicing in his, in, in his basement. Uh, but, and again, it was uh, mostly adults. And uh, so I, I did that through grade eight. And that was kind of mostly, I, 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 would, I would say that served to keep the, uh, the uh, engine oiled, if you will, you know? Um, it kept my interest. It kept me at least moving my body in space in, in, a, in, in a, in a martial art kind of way. Um, they did a very, it's see, I guess they did a very eclectic, uh, uh, kind of karate back then. I, I, I think it was, became a short new practitioner, but, uh, at that time it seemed kind of, uh, looking back on it, I recognize it as being a little more like, uh, uh an eclectic approach. Okay. And then it was back to California. And that's where I think that's kind of what I consider my true, the, the, the real genesis of it, you know, because uh, I, I guess I don't know if I'm rambling too much here already. Without no, this is, this is this is how we run the show. You, okay. you ramble and I hang out and keep you rambling. Got it. So. <laughs> So fast forward to, uh, we're back in California. It's grade nine and my mom takes uh, an assignment at a job site down in San Luis, San Luis Obispo County uh, in, in, in the central coast, paradise on earth. Um, and you know, I'm feeling, you know, I've, I've, I'm feeling a, a little bit better about myself in life. Uh, you know, I joined the swim team, uh, at, at Royal Grande High School. Um, and, uh, but I still wanted to do martial art. I had never forgotten that I still really wanted to practice martial art. So my mom comes home from work one day 
and tells me that she works with a Japanese man uh, who happens to teach uh, a style of karate. Uh, uh, turns out that style was wadori uh, karate, uh, wadori jujitsu kempo. Um, and uh, he was, he had just come down from himself. He had just transferred down from San Francisco, which were, which where the main office was and uh, where he had a large group training at the Embarcadero YMCA. And uh, he was a student of uh, a number of well-known wadori instructors, uh, Abe Sensei and Ajari Sensei, as well as uh, uh, frequent trips back to Japan, training both originally with the founder of Wadori, Hironori Otsuka, and uh, uh, Hironori Otsuka's son, Jiro, who became Hironori the uh, second upon his father's passing. So uh, I was able to to begin training in a really authentic style of Japanese budo uh, uh, there in San Luis Obispo County. Uh, and it's almost like, a, it, it, it's almost um, a little bit of a cliche in that the training was held at the local uh, Buddhist temple. The, you know, <laughs> because... Uh, so in, 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 on the West Coast, especially the, the, uh, Jodo Shinshu school of Buddhism has a number of, has had a number of temples. Uh, they had come, it had come over with the Japanese immigrants is, you know, in the late 1800s and, uh, they established, you know, uh, what they called churches, Buddhist churches up and down the West Coast. And, uh, they served as Japanese community centers as well. You know, they served as community centers for the local Japanese populations up and down the West Coast. So uh, it's pretty common, actually, for for uh, temples in the uh, Buddhist churches of America, the Jodo Shinshu school, to uh, have like karate and judo and kendo and ikebana and uh, shodo classes, all kinds of, of Japanese culture. The training was fantastic. You know, I remember... Uh, it, it, I have to backtrack. The first thing about that is, you know, Hiroka Sensei, his name was Heidi Hiroka. Hiroka Sensei had uh, put together a hard charging group of guys that he had gathered from the uh, from the from the uh, power plant there, you know, that he worked with, and then some others heard heard about it, and uh, he had initially been reluctant to accept uh, anybody under eighteen into training at all, and uh, but. Um, coming to know my mom through working with her and finding out that I, you know, I didn't have a father. Uh, he thought that this would be, you know, probably a good thing for a, a 14 year old kid to, to be doing. And, uh, so he, uh, accepted me into the class and for quite a while, I was the only, I was the only teenager in the class under the age of 18. And, uh, it was a hard charging group of, uh, uh of, of practitioners. And, uh, so I would go train after swim practice every day and we would have training three nights a week sometimes four and training would start at six and it would end when sensei decided he was done <laughs> which was usually quite late into the evening how old you know, were you again at this point i was four i was 14 by okay. this point i was yeah i was yeah i yeah it was 1984 Early '84 when I started training with Hiroko Sensei. Yeah, yeah. So that was a that was a wonderful time. Um, and due to the nature of Wadoryu, there was aside from you know kata and kumite that one usually associates with karate training. Uh, lots of jujitsu, lots of jujitsu, uh, jujitsu. Uh, uh, training as well because that that's the that's the the mark of Wadoryu as a as a as as a as a system. It's a it's a real synthesis of the karate that uh, Hiro Noriotsuka learned from Gichin Funakoshi and Choki Motobu. Uh, it's a synthesis of that karate with the uh, Shindo Yoshinryu Jujitsu in which he held a menkyo kaiden. So very uh, very. Karate in its outer appearance, but really driven by by principles of Japanese bujitsu, you know, jujitsu and kenjitsu. Those are really the 
the, the, the that's really the the driving uh, set of principles that underlying law that so it's so the so it was very different it was and, and it was very different from what most people think of when they think of karate but uh, that in itself kind of led to <laughs> made it difficult as we moved yet again to really uh, find to really find what suited me so because uh, we ended up leaving halfway through grade 11 I had gotten brown belt EQ with uh, Hiroka sensei and he is getting transferred back to San Francisco and trying and he was going to leave a group there but my mom was getting transferred back to the east coast so that's what happened next <laughs> yeah I, I find it interesting the way that you're talking about this as you put it nomadic lifestyle yeah yeah and so my yeah go ahead, go ahead. no 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 go no I, i'm just i'm wondering if you were as comfortable with it in the moment as you are now in hindsight you know, it be, had become so normal that it 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 seemed comfortable. Um, on the other hand, in hindsight, over the you know over the years, um, I, I think that some of the more negative impacts of that experience had 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 gotten uh, kind of uh, buried. Um, there were certainly, uh, difficulties that I had, I had difficulties, uh, academically, uh, at some point, mostly in, in mathematics and, and, and science and such, just the constant change made it, made it, uh, difficult to sustain, uh, uh academic success. Uh, I had to leave, um, a successful high school swimming career in California. Uh, I had to leave my training in, in karate training in, in California. Um, it, it, the long and short of it is, is it, it kind of was ended up being a setback again. Uh, cause I ended up going to a number of, a, a few high schools and, uh, um, I started to, especially in grade 11, kind of really turn inward again. Uh, grade 12 found us back in mystic and around people that I had known when I was there in grade eight and, and earlier in my, some of my um, elementary school years. But, uh, you know, it, the reality was, is that I was really kind of an outsider, you know, most of the time. So. When yeah. were you an outsider? Uh, were there, and, and I'm guessing we're all going to imagine the answer to this question, but was the dojo a place that you felt different that you felt like yes. you belonged? Yeah, I, I really did. And I had in grade 12, I looked around the, uh, at what was available, uh, in the area and between, you know, from new London, Connecticut over to Westerly Rhode Island places that I was able to get to. And, uh, there was quite a bit of more, even though it was, Okinawan karate that was being taught, you know, sure knew and such. Um, it was really kind of, everybody was really interested in that 80s point fighting thing. Mm -hmm. And I was never, ever intrigued with that at all. I did just, despite being, having been an athlete and, you know, and such and realizing some, some success in, in, in a competitive arena, uh, and therefore not not adverse to the idea of competition. I wasn't interested in that approach. And so I, uh, I, I found a, a game, kind of a hole in the wall, Goju-ryu Karate School. Uh, and I trained in Goju-ryu uh, in grade 12 and also started to practice Aikido. Uh, because, uh, for an old friend of my mom's from way back when, uh, uh, had been in Japan for a number of years, uh, and he came back from Japan with a sandan in, uh, in Aikido under, uh, Michio Hikitsuchi, who was one of the, uh, few to receive 10th dan from, uh, the founder of Aikido, Morihei Ueshiba. So I, I got to train Aikido as well for quite a while. So that was, that was really, uh, important as well. Uh, another, um, 
another uh, important point in terms of a springboard. And really, I, I guess what I'm getting to is most of these early experiences became the springboard as I, um, as I uh, grew, you know, and, and matured and evolved and, uh, and found my way uh, in Budo, you know. Hmm. That's also yeah. when I really got to start to study some EI uh, with uh, with with uh, my Aikido teacher. Um, I had been exposed to a little bit of EI uh, EIDO with uh, Hiroka Sensei in California, but uh, started to do a little bit more EIDO with uh, Ward Rafferty Sensei, my Aikido teacher, uh, and uh, that. Uh, yeah, those those the Aiki arts and the the, the jujitsu uh, uh, component of wadori and and sword was where I really knew I wanted to be, and uh, so I continued searching and traveling to go and find those things, which I ultimately did. All right, and not quite sure what I'm asking because you're, you're, yeah. con you're connecting pieces that are in some sense, you know, you could look at them and say, these are very disparate. These are very different things. You're, you're being eclectic. You're choosing, I, I want this and I want this, you know, mm -hmm. kind of looking for this martial arts buffet. And yet, you know, they're, they're not, they're not that if, if you take the, the systemic element out of it, you know, sword work mm -hmm. and grappling work, you know, that they're not that foreign to no. each other, right? No, no, they, they really aren't. So at this point um, in your in your journey, you've identified the pieces that you want. Yeah. And I'm guessing think, you're hoping to find somebody who has all of them together and you can just go to that one person. For, for, for the most part, yeah. Um, and again, you know, I... It, it took a long while. It took a long while to finally get that first shodan, for instance. And, 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 um, it, it, it was due in part to, it, it, to choices that I made. Uh, I, I found, found myself often in places where there weren't really like going to school in Vermont uh, when I was there. Um, you know, I, I would come down to Mystic and train in Aikido when I could and, and, and I kept up. A lot of the training that uh, I had uh, had been familiar with, um, but uh, I, in terms of of, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, I, I it I, to you it must sound like I have a completely different way of getting there uh, as far as the the standard uh, experience that most people have. It, uh, probably goes uh, just bouncing around uh, uh, earlier on, uh, and then and because of bouncing around geographically, there was a bouncing around in martial arts. So it wasn't really choosing a buffet approach. It, that's kind of kind of what uh, kind of uh, what life choices provided. I, I, maybe I misspoke. I wasn't suggesting oh. that. That it was quite choice based on where you were training, but I'm just I'm listening to how you're talking about certain things, the way you're talking about Yaido, and the way you're talking about the jujitsu component of the mm. Wadoru school. Mm. You know, you seem to have singled out the way you were talking about those pieces, and yeah. you know, I'm guessing that that you know your it was the the sword work, the kenjutsu yeah. aspect of Aikido that you probably were drawn to more. I mean, am I, am I getting this right? Yeah, you really, you, you really are. You really are. Um, so the, the long and short of it is, is that, um, I eventually found the teacher that I had been looking for, uh, for my life. And, and, you know, in the interim, I'd even gone back uh, and stayed with my Wadori teacher after, you know, not having seen him mm -hmm. in 10 years, I'd gone back and, to work and stay with my Wadori teacher while he was doing some house renovations, uh, in the Bay area and, uh, to, to, to train with him because I had never forgotten that approach to training that, that, that what I 
had experienced at that point is that deep, real, traditional Budo uh, uh, training, that character development training, that 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 cultivation of you know higher and deeper virtues beyond physical technique, and that was always something that was incredibly important to me. Uh, so I I uh, got went back there uh, in my mid to early twenties, twenty four. I think it was, and uh, and uh, stayed in stayed with he and his family and worked for him for a month and uh, trained every day and uh, and uh, uh, was initially tasked by him to to establish or bring back Wadoryu as it was taught uh, through the lineage he came from in in New England. Um, so that was uh that was a little part that was in the mix there in my mid twenties. But, uh, mm-hmm. talk, talk, talk about that. That's not something that most martial arts instructors are going to lay on top of a kid in their early twenties. Yeah. Um, at that time I had, I was also with, uh, uh, in, in, in mystic, I was living in mystic and, and the reason I had gone out to back out to train with Hiroka sensei was, uh, there was a little, a point of little time of unemployment there. So uh, I had been training in, uh, with, a, with another Aikido teacher that had recently come to the area. And uh, I went out to train in Wadori again with uh, Hiroka Sensei. Uh, I can, and just really intrigued by, even more intrigued at that point by the, the classical jujitsu component or the jujitsu roots of Wadori, which was really nice because I was a big part of that focus, of the focus for that, that time out there. Um, came, so after that point, came back east. My Aikido teacher, my second Aikido teacher at that time, Sean Nagel, uh, had been approached by a local um, jujitsu group, uh, a, a group that was uh, headed by two, uh, two gentlemen that were in the Navy and had studied um, Kodain Kan Jiu-Jitsu, you know, Danzan Ryu, the Okazaki lineage. And uh, they were looking to, they started cross-training with Nagel Sensei and uh, wanted to establish a dojo. And Nagel Sensei, knowing that I had been with Hiroka Sensei for, the, for, for a period in California and had come back uh, <laughs> Quite green still at Shodan, but uh, but tasked with uh, you know potentially establishing a Wado group in uh, in in New England. Uh, Nego Sensei asked me to to take part in that dojo as one of the uh, as a as a, one of the instructors and by offering Wado to you there. So we uh, we had that going for a little while, hmm. you know, we had that going for a little while, and. Uh, Things change like that. <laughs> you know, always seemed in my life. Um, the only constant, right? Yeah, yeah. So I was starting to get a, you know, a, 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 a nice background in a in a few different uh, Buddha traditions. And uh, um, fast forward to two thousand, and this is where, where I uh, where I come back to saying I found a teacher that I had been looking for. Uh, there was a reason I didn't go continue. I didn't go back to California, uh, the training with Hiroka Sensei. Uh, I won't go into that too much. Just that's okay. Yeah. Just, uh, um, it was, uh, it was a unique experience going back out there with him, but, uh, I knew that, uh, that wasn't something that I probably should, uh, uh, pursue, uh, in the future. Uh, and Wadori in New England at that point was was uh, uh, almost. Uh, I, I think it was. There, I think there was zero Wadori presence at that time. So really, uh, knowing that, uh, knowing uh, as as understanding how young I was, mid twenties, and the grade that I was carrying, uh, I felt it better to con- to to drop any concern with. Uh, with trying to establish something <laughs> uh, like that, uh, you know, establish a whole tradition, if you will, uh, or or help help it help it uh, help 
plant some seeds for it in a new area, I should say, not establish the tradition, but uh, help the tradition get established in an area. I was too young for that, too inexperienced for that. I was, it was much, uh, it was much more important for me to continue forward uh, uh, strictly as a student of Budo. Uh, so, uh, it, but in 2000, uh, I had the uh, great fortune to meet Carl Long out of uh, Kingston, Pennsylvania. And uh, Long Sensei, aside from being a very senior uh, practitioner of Shoryu uh, Karate, specifically the Shobayashi branch, uh, was also the senior most student of Masayuki Shimabukuro, uh, who would become the 21st generation Soshihan of Muso Jikiren Eishin Ryu Ei Heiho, for short, Eishin Ryu uh, Ei Jitsu. Mm. Uh, I began training with Long Sensei, traveling to Pennsylvania to train with him, seeing him at training events. And uh, very shortly thereafter, was also able to start training with Shimabukuro Sensei at events and training seminars uh, that he was leading. Um, I want I want to press the pause button. Yeah, because we're 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 getting a lot of details, and these are great, and these are important, oh. and they're giving us context to refer back to. Yeah, but I'm going to jump in from time to time, and you know, now we've got a pretty good foundation. Yeah, this is way too. And, I'm and, sorry, sorry, so no, no, long. Yeah, no, no, don't apologize, please. Um, you, you, you would have to work very, very hard to hold the record for the longest episode. So I'm, I'm not concerned. Oh, I'm sure. I, I, <laughs> I saw, I saw, I just, I don't want to come in. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. No, but I, I want to, I, I want to ask, cause we've spent a lot of time talking about the what, and I want to take a moment, talk about the why. Yeah. Cause, yeah. Cause in this, in this last minute, we just got, I mean, it, to me, it was, oh, you found the thing. Mm. Yai Jitsu. Mm. Right. Like I didn't even know that existed, but oh. five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago, whenever, whenever I, I, I broke in, that was, I mean, if we were to just pick random Japanese words, those were the two things that you were looking for. Yeah. And somebody yeah. had a style for it. So I want to know what it was like, not technically, not just physically. What was it like when you found that? I found was, was that, it, you know, yeah. ordained from heaven and you went, oh my gosh, this, this is, this is what I've been looking for. And you jumped up and down or was it, you know, much more subtle than that? No, uh, you know, that I, I think inside, I think internally it felt that way. Uh, uh, it felt like a, a jumping up and down. <laughs> um, I, 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 I really think it did. Um, I, it's not that what, was available to me in the immediate in in my immediate area it wasn't good valid it it was it a lot of my dear friends in this area are you know high level uh teachers uh of those arts uh now you know uh the the leading a new generation you know a new them them actually being the uh, the the new generation of leadership in those traditions but what was available wasn't really for me. It wasn't what grabbed me. And what grabbed me was that, that deeper intention, but also that older, older, uh, tradition that these, the, what, what's called Kori, you know, the, the old schools of, of, of Japanese arts, uh, the arts that were, developed in in japan prior to 1868 you know uh maybe it was the romantic or, or some romantic inclination you know the, somewhere way way deep um i i that's what i found compelling as i you know because through all this journey i'd also read you know as much as i could and uh tried to find out as much as i could about you know, Japan, Budo, martial arts, martial arts in general, not just Japanese martial arts, of course, but, but that's, that was what I had been exposed to. And so that, the, 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 the from a, uh, from a 
kind of a cultural sense, that's what resonated with me and seemed to make sense, most sense for me. And that's, and I've had that great immersion back in San Luis Obispo County. Um, I knew that that's what I wanted. And by, by, uh, by sheer luck, um, I found, uh, someone in, in Pennsylvania who, 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 along with his teacher and their teacher, the 20th generation headmaster of that particular sword school, uh, exemplified in, 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 to, to me, uh, everything that I was, I was ser- searching for, you know, it, there's, there's absolutely no doubt that they, they exemplified, uh, the physical and technical, uh, portion of the art, the, 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 the technical corpus. I mean, it, absolutely, uh, absolutely eminently skillful budoka. Um, but it was who they were and what they were about that really captured, uh, my interest. So the fact that I could study this kori, this, 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 Japanese sword school of over 450 years in standing, uh, that retained all of its claws and fangs, if you will, in terms of, of it being a, a, a school developed by the samurai of, to, you know, of Tosa for, for use in life and death combat, then, um, it retained all of those teachings. It hadn't been watered down. It hadn't been changed into something, uh, that was more about aesthetic performance or, or, or just a, um, a moving philosophical practice. It was Budo. It was life and death Budo with that higher and deeper heart, you know? Yeah. Where Shimo Sensei, Shimo Bokuro Sensei, uh, the, the, the 21st generation headmaster, um, very, had very much a sense of mission. His teacher, Miura Sensei, the, very, a, a deep sense of mission. And Long Sensei, uh, that, and, and that's why Long Sensei, yeah, when he found Shimo Bokuro Sensei, um, leapt at the opportunity to, to train with Shimo Bokuro Sensei and Miura Sensei because of this while not just because of being able to ha- have the great opportunity to to study a uh, 450 living 450 year old living budo tradition but to study such a tradition with men who were really interested in changing the world through budo you know um that sense of mission, it was even, um, exemplified in the, uh, in the name of Yura Sensei's dojo in Japan, that Jiki Shin Kan. Jiki Shin means direct to the heart. You know, Jiki is direct, Shin is heart, mind. So, you know, both Mira Sensei and Shimabukuro Sensei used to speak all the time of, you know, changing the world from heart to heart to heart. And, uh, for them, Budo, while retaining, as I said, the technical corpus, the principles, the methodologies, the strategies that were used in life and death combat in feudal Japan, it was that sense of mission, you know, to, to help improve your community and thereby help to improve your, your society by, you know, working on changing yourself internally, right? Awakening to uh, uh, a higher reason in life, you know, living a life built on a foundation of gratitude and dignity, wisdom, hopefully, and compassion. Most importantly, um, that, as I said, that's what really that's what really grabbed me. That synthesis of a living, breathing kōryu with this real deep urgent sense of mission for 
uh, living a life of virtue, you know, and, and, and this, this tradition really serving as, as a vehicle for actualizing that life of virtue, you know? Yeah. And, uh, 20 years later, I, I find myself, uh, one of the senior, uh, practitioners and instructors under, uh, Long Sensei, who since, uh, Shimabukuro Sensei is actually both Mira Sensei and Shimabukuro Sensei, uh, passed away in, uh, 2012. Um, Mira Sensei had years earlier transmitted the art completely to Shimabukuro Sensei, uh, uh, naming him the 21st generation inheritor, Soshihan. Uh, in 2012, Wong Sensei became the 22nd generation Soshihan, uh, of our line of Muso Jikiren Nation. Um, and, uh, I find myself often curiously, uh, in the position of being one of the uh, senior practitioners, instructors, uh, under training under him and helping him propagate the art, uh, throughout the Northeast, through the, throughout the country. Um, it's really, as I said, quite curious to me how I arrived here, given that, that really odd training history, you know, that, yeah, that I have. Um, you're, you're using some interesting words to talk about teaching or sharing of information. You, you said propagate, you said transmit. And, you know, if this was at the beginning of the, the conversation, I might think, oh, this is just part of your speech pattern. But I, I, I suspect not. It, it sounds like you, you're choosing those words very carefully. Uh, that's what we do. I um <laughs> you know yeah it's um I'm I'm not sure how to respond to that actually and that's okay maybe you don't you don't necessarily yeah. have to yeah you know we, we I think for any of us the things that we spend our time doing martial arts and non yeah show what is important to us you know if I spend a lot of time Working on my house, I probably love my house. If I spend a lot of time with family, I love, I really love my family. Um, you know, hiking, I love being outdoors. When, when we can find that, that concept to martial arts and what we study, we find one of two groups of people. We find people who train what they've trained because they've always trained it and they don't know other options. You know, not to say that what they're training is bad, it's just that's what they do. Yeah. And then you have other people who, like yourself, have trained a whole bunch of different things all over from a bunch of different people and ultimately find what, I guess the word I'll choose here is resonates yeah. best oh, yeah. for them. Yeah. And as you're talking about training, you have talked about this tradition that you're involved in now differently. And, and I would encourage you to listen to, and I bet the listeners are are hearing it too, that there's there's something deeper, there's something reverential in the way that you view and engage with this art. And it's not something I've heard very often from people. And in every case, it's been someone who, how do I want to put this? They, it's cliche, but when the student's ready, the master appears, right? So take it back to that moment where I said, you know, was it, was it clear that this was, you know, some gospel, you know, overhead angel singing, this is the art that you wanted, right? And here it is. And, and, and you confirmed that a bit that, yeah, there, there was something there that yeah. I was jumping up and down inside. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to imagine that based on what you're saying, and the clear dedication that you have via the language you're using, that what you are involved in now is far beyond 
the physical techniques. It has had a tremendous impact on you and who you are. And I'm guessing you're aware of it. So I want to, I want to know more about that. I want to know more about how Eric Johnstone is a different person because of this training that we're talking about right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, there, there is definitely a sense of, uh, of reference. Uh, not that we, not that we deify or reify the individuals that came before us. I don't deify or rev or, you know, my, my, my teacher or my teachers, but, uh, in fact, I, 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 I'm, I'm actually quite close to him and, uh, and we've spent enough time together that, uh, you know, are, we're very aware of each other's humanity, you know, but, uh, there is reverence for the living f- tradition, the flow that has come down through 22 generations, the, the sense of, of mission, but uh, also a, a, a profound sense of, of obligation, um, obligation to Long Sensei, obligation to Shimabukuro Sensei, um, to the only to, to repay them for allowing me to receive uh, their teachings. Um, that repayment comes in the form of obligation to those that I have the good fortune to provide instruction to. Um, so there's it's like an obligation that moves in two different directions through time. You know, we have this sense of obligation to the future generations, uh, to students that haven't even walked through the door yet to transmit this living tradition. Uh, undiluted to transfer the heart, to transfer the soul of what makes this tradition what it is and what makes the men that passed it on to us. And I, I say men because there have not yet in our line been any, uh, uh, in our direct line, any uh, women that have inherited uh, the tradition. Although Mira Sensei does have Another uh, did have another senior student, a, 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 a kohai, Toshima Bukuro Sensei, uh, who did start with who did start her own line. So there is a line of Asian view out there in Japan, headed by a woman. So that's that's mm-hmm. kind of nice. But um, you know, there the, the, as I said, that that sense of of obligation um, moves. In two, you know, through through two directions through time. Uh, there's a sense of gratitude even when I'm in my dojo. Uh, you know, we have a every dojo has a way of beginning and ending a class, right? In Japanese, we call that reiho, right? The, or reishiki, the etiquette uh, that uh, one uh, with which one conducts themselves, but also uh, specifically the formal way of beginning or ending a class and. Uh, there's a usually three bows in Asian Ryu. Uh, the the bow, you know, to the front of the dojo, the kamidana, the and such. Uh, the the bowing to the living legacy that is the art. Mm. And then, uh, you know, there's the shire, shi meaning instructor, re meaning bow, and then tore bowing to the sword. But coming to shire, you know, that's the, the point here. Um, shire is really a, a, a bow that, especially when we do the reho in a non-verbal way, the teacher initiates the bow. The teacher bows to the students first and the students respond and bow back to the, to the instructor. So it's not students bow to the instructor. It's, it's a recognition of respect flowing in both directions. The mutual interdependence of, of teacher and student. Uh, teacher doesn't, a teacher doesn't exist in that role without the students sitting across from him or her. Mm-hmm. 
uh, we don't get to fulfill our obligations to transmit the art without students coming to the dojo, without students coming to training events. So our very existence in the role of teacher is entirely dependent on the existence of the role of the student. And so Shire is a, a recognition of that. It's an, ex, it's an act that expresses that hurt. You know, it's the things like that, I think, that for me make uh, such a significant impact, that make it so meaningful, so so alive. Just simply bowing, bowing wholeheartedly, uh, completely being the bow, you know? And it's, this is not also about copying and mimicking somebody else's culture. I tell my students, yes, you know, we're, you know, this is Japanese, this is old Japanese Budo, this is Koryu Japanese Budo, so we don't westernize it. You know, we don't attach our ideas and uh, uh, we don't change things to suit our Western inclinations. And there's nothing wrong with that in modern martial arts that do that. Uh, but coming back to this idea of not, m we're not just merely parroting or mimicking somebody else's cultural construct. When you do shire or when you do haire, that bow at, at the beginning, the standing bow and where you're bowing to the, that, that legacy that, that has gone before us, being handed down to us over the course of 22 generations from heart to heart to heart. The idea is that you embody that action fully and completely in that moment. It's this, and you should have the same heart, the same feeling, just when you shake somebody's hand or greet somebody or give someone a hug, it's wholehearted, single minded action and intention, wholehearted just being that thing, you know? And uh, and so then when you're doing physical technique and you're drawing the sword, you know, nukitsuke, cutting it, single action, finishing downward cut, kiryoroshi, wholeheartedly being nukitsuke, no separation, wholehearted, wholeheartedly being, embodying kiryoroshi, you know, and uh, I think I think that's what makes this pathway so profoundly significant for me. Some heavy stuff. <laughs> it's intense. It's intense. It's the ability to be present in that way. It, it's it's so difficult and yet so necessary. It's something I've been working on myself quite a bit yeah. through this pandemic because sure. otherwise I'm losing my mind. Yeah. Do you find yeah. it easier to do that with a sword in your hand? Um. Certainly, there's a. Uh, uh, there's a well, you know, it's it 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 it, it, it definitely changes things. Um, you know, everybody, of course, hears, you know, in weapons training and martial art, you know, weapons should become an extension of your body. And, but uh, we really do, we really, really dig deeply into this idea. Mira Sensei uh, used to speak of it all the time. Ken Shin Ichi Nyo. You know, the sword in the, sword in the mind is one thing. So when the sword is being drawn, sword draws. It's not I draw the sword, you know. Sword draws, sword cuts. Um, I think maybe I'm, I, I might be starting to answer a, slight, a question you didn't ask, but I think what a, what a sword does, especially when you're training uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a Shinkan, a live blade, which uh, we generally don't do in groups of people. I, I train with a Shinkan when I don't have people around me. But, uh, but there's something very immediate about a sword. And it's one of those things that separates uh, classical Japanese sword art from a lot of more Gendai 
Budo, you know, modern martial art like karate and such. Really, every time you're doing waza or a, or a kata, um, a sword is drawn. Somebody's life ended. That was it, right? So in actuality, each time you do waza, you're recreating a life and death situation. Something that our lineage forebearers, our, our Budo ancestors experienced right up until 1868 when our 17th generation headmaster, Oe Masumichi Sensei, uh, fought as a 15 year old in, in the Boshin War, uh, at, at the, uh, end of the Tokugawa shogunate, the, the four, four day battle of Toba Fushimi. Um, you know, the, right up until 1868 in our lineage, we had, uh, we had a man born in the samurai class that, that fought with the, with these methods and took lives with these methods because that's what was necessary. And that, that experience, of course, changed him profoundly. But, uh, there's something incredibly real and immediate about that understanding of what it is that you're creating, recreating. Yeah. It was a, it was a life and death Buddha. That was it. Hmm. So I, I, I find that with regard to that single mindedness, uh, I, I find that it is, for me, um, a very efficacious way of of, of experiencing that that mm. that 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 place. I, I also, you know, I I, I I also I practice Zen. I've been, uh, and so I sit in zazen every day. Uh, in fact, we just had an online retreat a couple weeks ago over the course of two and a half days, and the Saturday. Uh, that Saturday, I think I spent about almost eight hours total from five in the morning till, uh, 10 o'clock at night with, uh, breaks in between sitting zazen. And those mm-hmm. breaks were actual work practice and body practice. Uh, my, so my body practice was, was doing EI and, uh, and, and such. So, uh, so I'm reinforced. My point is I'm reinforcing that place so frequently in my life, right? So it's, it's that structure. There's a physical structure that's necessary for Japanese Budo, especially sword arts. That same physical structure, uh, is required in Zazen. Uh, that same physical structure is required in the Aiki arts that we teach in our dojo. Um, so I am constantly reinforcing the, that, that mind and body, that, that heart, that, that place. So, yeah. Let's switch gears yeah. a little bit because I I, I want to I want to tie some of these ends together. We we've got we've got a lot of thread here, and that, yeah, that's not a bad thing. It's I, I certainly don't want you to think that's a, a negative judgment. It's just an observation, mm. and it's because there have been a lot of a lot of bits, a lot of stories, a lot of aspects mm. that we've talked about here today. Yeah, and I really didn't even intend to get into all those I know. details. I know. You know, that's that's the beauty of this format is I just kind of <laughs> hang out and people talk, and uh, quite often in hindsight they go, "Huh, why did I go there?" Yeah, that's what needed to happen today. Mm. So, first, the first thing that I want to do is I want to, I kind of want to flip the the clock over. You know, mm. we've been talking about the past, we've talked about today. We we'll to talk about the future. Mm. You know, I, I'm, I'm, no, you're welcome to, I'm not going to put su- such a fine point on it to, to guess your age, but I've got a rough idea based on dates and ages that you gave us. Yeah. And in the world of, of, well, just in the world, you're, you're still quite young. Yeah. You've got decades um, ahead of you. I'm, I'm 51. I'm 51. Uh, but a very, I, I find a very youthful feeling, uh, 51, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I, I train Budo every day. I lift weights pretty well every day. Uh, um, so keeping young and healthy, uh, yeah. 
And that's part of my obligation to my, especially, you know, to, to, to the arts that I teach. It's part of my obligation to, to my, to my teacher, uh, in that, not that he's ever asked me to, do, to, to, but he hasn't put it that way. But, uh, I haven't, you know, we, the senior group of, of instructors immediately under him, we're all kind of starting to get up there and there are some, you know, we're realizing some issues with knees or, Sure. this that or the other so part of my personal intention my part of what drives me it's keeping young and healthy so i can you know just serve as do my job you know every what time is, we have, what is your job my job is to help him transmit the art to to our to the members of our of our to the to the members of our core uh um, so when we go to training events, I'm often called out onto the floor to demonstrate what we are working on at that moment. And that often means receiving corrections mm -hmm. for the benefit of everybody else. But, uh, I have to, I, I go to all of these events with a job to do. We demonstrate in Japan in, uh, for the, in, in the Butoku Dane in front of some of the senior most teachers of Budo in Japan and members of the Imperial family. And I, I have a job to do. You know, um, so I take that, I take that obligation really seriously. So yeah, I, 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 despite my, my age, uh, I don't find 51 to be old at all. So, um, I continue to, to, to train with, uh, with, uh, intensity. Mm. The, the older I get, the, the more I think age truly is, is a mindset. I'm 41. And, and if I, you know, if I didn't look in the mirror and notice the white hairs in my beard and, and the, the lack of hair on top of my skull, I would think I was in my 20s. Yeah, yeah. I, I certainly don't feel 41. I get the sense you don't feel 51. Oh, not at all. Not at all. You know, I, I, yeah. It, it, it puts you in this interesting position because you have a, a fair amount of responsibility. Yeah. It, it sounds like. and. Uh, you're not alone yeah. in that. And yet yeah. the way you're talking about that responsibility doesn't sound like someone who's 51. It sounds like someone, it sounds like the the folks in the 60s, their 60s or 70s who guessed on this show. And I, I think that creates an opportunity, but I don't know what it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, Cause it gives I, you that I, much I, more time. Yeah. It gives you that time in that role to, further the the transmission the propagation of this art in a way that seems appropriate to you and to others you know wh whoever however oh and and that's also you know while realizing that you know i'm still growing and still learning and still receiving instruction and correction and you know there's so much more there's so much more to do uh it just so happens that I've also been tasked with with the job of 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 helping to to transmit this this art forward. You know, my my teacher made promises to his teachers, and uh, and uh, I've pledged to assist him in fulfilling that promise to the best of my ability. Um, let, yeah. let, me, let me ask you a question that I don't know if I asked it in this way before. Um, hmm. You know, I, I, I trust my gut at this point, you know, I've been doing this for years and tend to trust my gut. And sometimes I'll take a shot. Usually works. Mm -hmm. Maybe it doesn't. Let's, let's fast forward some decades. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter to me how many, and you're dying mm -hmm. and you're sitting there laying there, however you envision it. Mm -hmm. And somebody comes in and they say, with regard to your martial arts, were you successful in achieving your goals? Mm. Are, are you aware? Do you have those goals thought out? Is there, are there concrete things or is it more subjective? There, there, there's, it's actually, it's actually a few things. Um, first of all, it was a lifelong goal to have my own dojo. That took forever, but I finally did it. And it took forever because I chose to pursue arts that weren't going to be bringing people flocking to the dojo and breaking down the doors to get in. Um, it took me a long time teaching over the course of however long it's been now, uh, usually renting time and space from dojo run by 
colleagues and dear friends of mine to finally uh, to finally get to the place where I could have my own dojo. And that wasn't without some serious coaching uh, along the way, you know, somebody else showing me that it could be done. So that goal, a lifelong goal, has indeed been realized. Um, I don't do it for a living. I do have a day job. That is okay because that day job affords me a tremendous degree of responsibility to follow through on this calling, uh, which is really how I see it, uh, this calling. Um, it allows me to respond to that calling. So yes, I have fulfilled uh, concrete goals in terms of of having my own tradition, little traditional Japanese Budo dojo, um, having a place where we can come together where we have the opportunity for, for practice to take place, having the opportunity to, to have my teacher, uh, come and provide instruction to all his students. Cause we're all his students ultimately. Um, so that's a, that's a very concrete goal that's, that's been realized. Uh, I didn't expect to, to be in the senior leadership in this Koryu. I didn't expect to, uh, be leading an Aiki Budo, Aiki Jiu Jitsu, uh, group that, uh, others are seeking to connect with. Uh, but that just happens to be what has taken place in terms of, Realizing goals, uh, it, it, it's kind of more subjective goals. It's, it's hard to say. Um, there's no doubt that this pathway, uh, makes me a better human being. It helps me cut through very <laughs> viscerally, very, you know, it's, it's kind of it, it, very, uh, it, it, as a swordsman, it's much less of a metaphor than it is for others, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a pathway. It's a practice that, uh, is a, a, a vehicle through which I work on cutting through my own delusion, my own greed, anger, and ignorance. Okay. And, uh, the thing is, is the, the, the more, the more grime you wipe away off of your consciousness, the more work you realize there is to do. Uh, and so, it's a never ending process. It's a never ending process of refining and refining. You know, it's, uh, transmuting that, that r rubble into gold, you know, uh, realizing the light in the, in, existing in the depths of, uh, of your life. Um, that's a never ending goal. It's never going to be accomplished. I guess the answer to that is what others who know me would say at that time. You know, did I make a difference in this life? Was I a good man? Was I a good father? Was I a good husband? Was I a good son? Was I a good student? Was I a good teacher? If I can say yes to any of those things, or if the people that love and know me can say yes to those things, that's a victory. People want to reach out to you. Email, yes. website, social media, any stuff like that you're willing to share? Oh, of course. Yeah. Um, so my website is shinokanbudodojo.com. Uh, my email is shindokan1 at gmail.com. Shindokan is S-H-I-N-D-O-K-A-N. Um, yeah, you know, we, and people are always welcome to if people are martial art practitioners or not, or want to be martial art practitioners. Uh, people are always welcome to visit, you know, uh, Matt Butler comes down from keen to visit. Andrew's Andrew is talking about coming down to visit. Um, I always welcome anybody with, uh, that's, uh, is genuinely interested you know, uh, genuinely curious, uh, has good intention, you know, um, 
we welcome our, our doors are open to people if they want to come and see what uh, our at least at, at my level of understanding uh Koryu Japanese sword Musoji Kiren Asian EI is or uh our expression of Aiki Jujitsu is uh people are always welcome right on. Typically, I, I ask some kind of broad, esoteric sort of, you know, how do you want to close out the show kind of vague thing as we fade out to the outro. But we, we've done so much of that. <laughs> that's That's been the whole discussion. And it, it's not a bad thing. And, and the reason I'm not going to ask it is because I'm afraid you gave us your best stuff and and and... You know, I'm sure you have a few things left in the holster, but I was saying it would bore everybody. <laughs> no, no. But, hey, let's be honest. If they're if they're still listening, they're not bored. Yeah, yeah. Or right, they're that's, next. that's one of the beauties of this format is <laughs> yeah. you know nobody's going to suffer through it if they don't if they don't want to, and that's okay. You know, we have people that pick and choose episodes. It's all good. Yeah. So I I, I want to ask a different question. Sure. And we'll, and we'll cut after this. It's it's been a, a strange road for you, martial arts wise. <laughs> what a long, strange trip it's been. Yeah. It's, and you know, I could I could ask the cliche, "Would you change anything?" And I suspect the answer is no, because it wouldn't have gotten you where you are. But I have asked this question a few times before, so I'm going to run with this one. Mm-hmm. If you now could go back to you in i think you said fifth grade when you Mm. started training that first day and you said that other than tv you weren't really interested or even aware of martial arts as an option Mm. let's say you got 60 seconds with you then what would you say Mm. that's a really good question I would say, uh, cause I was, I was in grade five. Yeah. Have fun, have fun, grow, feel good about yourself. Feel good about yourself. Do your best. This is about, uh, you know, be a good kid. Do your best. Be a good kid. Have fun. It's all going to be okay. I wouldn't have said anything about you should do this, that, or the other in terms of martial arts specifics. Have fun. Feel good about yourself. It may take a while, but life is going to be good. Life is going to be very good. Dude, that's it. Oh, thank you so much. I, like I said, there was a lot that you, that I got into that I really didn't expect to. I hope you enjoyed that one. I had a blast. So much fun. Just such a passionate martial artist. And I suspect someone that I would be good friends with. So we chatted a bit after the show closed, as you might imagine. And, uh, Hopefully the training part, maybe the friendship part will come to pass in the near future. Fingers crossed. If you want to know more, you want to go deeper, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check out the transcripts and the videos and the links and all that good stuff. You know, all that stuff you caught during the show that you said, oh, what was that website again? Yeah, we write it down for you. Go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Sign up for the newsletter while you're there. We don't send out very many issues. We're not going to bombard you. We're not going to sell your list, but we are going to help you stay up to date on the show and whistle kick in general. And if what we're doing, if we're putting down, you're picking up, if you enjoy it, if you want to support it, please be willing. Share episodes, rate things, buy things, or consider the Patreon. If you see somebody out there wearing something with whistle kick on it, say hello, introduce yourself. If you want to follow us on social media, we're at whistle kick everywhere and my personal email address, jeremy at whistlekick.com. I love hearing from people. If you've got feedback or suggestions, I want to hear them. But until next time, train hard, smile, 
and have a great day. 